This is Anime Archaeology Station, broadcasting anime analysis to anyone who will listen. We have a basement archive full of an ever-growing collection of anime media. We tell you about it and explain the terms and tropes behind this unique medium. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to the broadcasts. Today we're going to look at the original mobile suit Gundam. Now, this is Steve and I digging deep into the first episode of the original Gundam series. As a reminder, this came out in 1979, all the way back there. Back when anime was still very much for kids, there were a couple of anime that were aiming a little higher, stuff like Space Battleship Yamato from 74. Um, but Gundam really um, marked a change in all of that. It was really a look at a more complex, more adult future world. Now, it's not aimed at, like, adults, adults, although I'm sure they hoped adults would be watching, but it's certainly aimed at an older audience than the, like, young preteens that anime had generally been targeting uh, with their with most shows up to that point. So that's certainly a standout. Also notable that Gundam is about a an actual war between humans. Uh, you know, there's no fantastical elements of, of aliens, you know, science fictional elements like aliens. So it is much more direct than a lot of other uh, anime series at the time. And it was very much meant to be political in a sense that it, it was meant to make people think about war in a nuanced way. Um, and to really delve into a lot of the themes around war without glamorizing it or glorifying it. So it then spawned a massive franchise. So we get to go back and see like the, the, the genesis of that franchise and why it's so important and interesting. So here we go. Hope you find this interesting. I should also point out before we start, we had to do these in the bunker. So the backgrounds are going to look different. I couldn't do it in this room. I had to do it down in the bunker room. So our broadcast looks a little weird in for that one. Also, as usual, we're not going to actually show you the episode itself. So you can kind of go back and look at it in detail. Um, you're not going to be restricted by our viewing. You can watch it and pause it. There'll be the time code in there as well. So you can go back and, and check exactly what we're talking about in an individual episode. So uh, here we go. So we're starting with a shot of Earth. Um, it's interesting because sometimes you get anime which kind of, you know, starts with Earth and then we zoom in on Japan and the hero on his motorcycle. But I do think this is, this doesn't feel like this. This feels bigger and we're already getting into this bombastic music. So it definitely feels more kind of epic and spacey in tone. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, as we're going in on this, uh, you know, as you say, uh, you zoom in on Japan or something, I'm, I'm not getting that feeling. I'm getting that feeling of falling in almost. Hmm. Like, you know, like something is, is about to happen and we're just going to throw you on a trajectory that's not going to be in total control here. So, you know, see what see what happens here. Indeed. Hmm. Oh, that's clever. I literally just realized that's a sunrise. Did they mean to do that? I don't know. Did they, who knows? It's a new graphic, though. It is. Also interesting, it also has kind of an eyeball feel. Yeah. Hmm. Cornea. Yeah. 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 Huh. Now, I'm not sure, seeing this fade in, so this is on the original uh, DVD release in, in America. Um, so that Gundam is definitely original title. I'm not sure if that mobile suit was original. It looks like it's original to the, the, the print. Yeah. So I think they originally meant this to be, you know, full English title, which is unusual. Wow. Hmm. Okay. All right. So pretty typical opening here so far. You know, yep. entire crew sort of showing all there. Actually, did you see that? Which one? Um, so if you if you rewind and he shoots the gun, there's an actual casing that comes out. Interesting. You're right. Yeah. Wow. There's a. Let me see if I can I can show you. Do you think that's like in? Well, are the rest of their guns like that, or are they all like blasters? Well, you see, that's what I thought too. I thought I thought they would be mostly blasters, but this would definitely be 
um, I don't know. It's it's kind of hard to say. A, a nation that was, you know, so anti-war that we would see this. Yeah. You know, this kind of thing. And that little minute detail of the shell casing coming out and, you know, picking up on that. And for some for some people, that would be natural and you wouldn't even even notice it. Um, but, yeah, it, it kind of you know it, it it speaks to what kind of weaponry we're, we're going to see later on i guess and it is kind of from that period you know you've got um um lupon the uh, third mm -hmm. you know maybe five years prior to this so um you know you have that greater sense of realism to anime now hmm. right i wonder yeah i i do wonder in this opening we've got all of the shots of the various mecha um right i wonder how much this is a toy you know commercial in in the opening credits like how much like, right. it's like okay your opening credits have got to showcase all of the toys you can buy i don't know now i have to say this is a weird shot <coughs> yeah you know main character throwing his arm up in the air it's a very joyous shot and it but it's a very abstract shot so it's odd with all the other shots we've had in here, which are very much just, I mean, the characters are on an abstract background, but it's kind of them, you know, around. And obviously not meant to be too indicative of a real scene. But this is just very, I don't know, s symbolic, well, but I don't know what the symbol is. Well, it goes at odds with his, with the previous shot of him shooting a gun. Yeah, you're right. Um, also interesting having the... Um, I don't know. I mean, is is he reaching towards the future? Maybe I don't know. Hopeful. I definitely yeah. hopeful. I mean, he has a positive expression on. We'll zoom yeah. in a little bit. Huh. I don't know. Also, kind of interesting here. I mean, we've both seen this show. We we, we both know right. what's happening here. Um, is that Elbow a coup? Is that the moon? What what is that behind them? Doesn't look like the. I mean, maybe it's the moon. It, is it yeah? Is it loom? Is I mean that's kind of weird. I mean, well, I mean, it, you know, they're inside their craters, mm -hmm. um, you know, you know that kind of a thing going on. But yeah, is it? It doesn't feel like the moon. It feels like something no. else. Yeah, it, it feels like an asteroid of some kind. Yeah, um, and it's just kind of strange to have. Like, I I don't recognize that background, so right. it's not like they needed a shot and so grabbed you know a background from somewhere um mm -hmm. it seems intentional and it also is possible that it's just something that they had some concept they planned for the show or some base that they never got to right yeah interesting well if you notice right up in the um upper left quadrant you see that one dot up there yeah would that be the moon and and just kind of give you an idea yeah of scope oh is that earth or earth yes. i don't know I, I literally can't tell. Um, also interesting that they're implying, and again, got to be impressed by this, they're implying that because we can see the sun, it's blocking out all the stars. Yeah. Um, and look, all we can see is that, is, you know, moon or earth, whatever that is. Huh, that's kind of cool. Okay, so we've got to talk about this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we got the... the classic opening credits sequence and i love how it starts with all this green and you're panning across this green and then suddenly you see this strange black um break in everything uh and this angle i know when i first saw this i was like what am i seeing um this doesn't make sense this doesn't look like anything like real um and it's only afterwards you realize it's actually a, a colony a space colony okay well <laughs> <laughs> um, so, like my my, I totally forgot this is how it started. Um, my first reaction is like, okay, so they're showing you this colony, and I think that the as they're talking about it, I think what they wanted to show with the blackness of showing you this is something in space, and look at the curvature of all of this. Yeah. So it's making you think about why is this curving upwards? Okay, this can't be on Earth. Mm -hmm. This is not on Earth at all. So what is this? And then they go through the whole thing of a very short exposition of saying, okay, man has gone from Earth to, to the stars, mm -hmm. so to speak. And so and this is how they live. 
and how they die. And boy, wow. That's, that's <laughs> what great writing there, not just in the line itself, but, you know, and yeah. die, and then you see a giant explosion. But then also realizing it's, it's a bit like the, the uh, explosions in Evangelion, where yes. it's not just a normal explosion. You realize, wait, wait, what? This isn't just like uh, a factory exploding. This is a right. beam piercing from outside. Yes, this is intentional. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and then it also speaks just kind of the fragility of a space colony, that if it hits with a weapon, it's over. Yeah. All right, so this is really our first shot of Musa's um, mm-hmm. and of like spaceships to, to speak of. We saw them a little bit in the background of the opening credit sequence, but it's kind of, you know, they're, you're really seeing the mecha there. Um, right. Interesting, the style here. It's definitely a very 70s style of spaceship. Yeah. The, the, the curvature, the kind of sleekness of the ships. It's kind of a... Um, uh, a World War II battleship merged right. with a spaceship. Um, and definitely one of the things that in you don't see much of in later Gundam series. That that particular, like, visual style. Or, back, or yeah. ship style. Yeah, ship style, yeah. Hmm. Actually, so this right here mm-hmm. is definitely a World War II image. I mean, that's mm-hmm. just... You know, that's the... You, you see this in newsreels of the Japanese... Armada moving mm. through the ocean, mm-hmm. and this is a formation that they were they were in. Wow! And and that's you know kind of interesting. And also, I think it's kind of interesting how they they make it a little demon face in the yeah the <laughs> side there, like you know like as if to say you know we are the aggressors, the attackers, and we're coming for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely seventies anime style there. Yeah, no question. So I did want to talk a little bit about this this shot because it's kind of interesting. Um, You'll notice that the the lights are actually on top of the battleship, which right. should be in front of the lights. I suspect this is one of those things where just literally there were too many visual elements on this to actually make them overlap properly. Um, <laughs> like, you want the lights to be bright and to be overwhelming everything. So if they were behind the space cruiser, it would just look weird. The, the, right, the cruiser yeah. was completely obliterating those. So you put it in front of anything, everything to give across this idea that it's a blinding white light. It's weird because like it works. You, you, your brain doesn't notice it until somebody pauses and goes, "Wait, the battleship is in front of all those. Why are they overlapping?" Yeah, it's very. It's a very chaotic scene, which is what it's meant to be. Exactly. You know, just like, you know, here's this thing happening, and all these explosions, and you'll notice that the first thing you notice is that. The ship I'm seeing is not like the other ships. Mm-hmm. True. And so you're kind of going, mm, okay, what's going on here? Who's fighting? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. Okay, so I get another sort of classic image there um, of a colony going down. And I, I just love the visual storytelling here of all of the Zaku's turning to look. Yeah. Like, they're all surprised at this. Like, they're all, what the heck is going on with this colony? It gets across very much more than just what the narrator is saying. This idea that this, the fact that this colony is going down is a surprise to the combatants, even. All right, another classic shot. Um, yeah, go ahead. This is this is a not a pulling of the punch. This is like for an anime. You're a kid. You're watching this. Let's say you're ten years old, and you're like going. So everyone's gone, right? <laughs> They're just blowing up buildings, right? That's mm-hmm. just, you know, everybody, everyone was evacuated on both the the, the thing and on, on the, the colony and in and, and the city. No, and it's and I, it's very simplistic, but for its time, it's just got that. Just and you can hear the noise, and that's the other part mm-hmm. I love about this is that you hear the noise, and it's just this slow, just like slow burn of just like literally, you know, just of a. Of a <laughs> impending burning explosion yeah. you're just like oh this can't be good no this isn't going to be oh wow they're, we're seeing the thing going actually into this oh god mm-hmm. and it gives you an idea of scope yes for what the colonies are because you know they're talking about independence and uh, independence and you know as we 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 think of past space stations mm-hmm. yeah you know they're True. tiny little things that we you know hatches and stuff like that no this is an actual space city literally mm-hmm. coming into Earth. I mean, that's just 
And then the next question goes, who does that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then having that be uh, synchronized to the narration that tells you right. both sides have lost half their respective populations. Wow. You know, in eight months. Eight months. That's, that's no joke. It's, that is definitely no joke. What's also amazing about this shot is, like, you know, to your point, it's coming down. And, I mean, obviously, from a physics perspective, this idea, the idea that this entire object would make it down unharmed, you know, and then touch down and then explode is, is seems physically unrealistic. But the shot has such power. You forgive all that. Um, yeah. It's also remarkable because it is the simplest. It's a pull cell. It is literally just, yeah. you know, a colony image getting pulled down and then you animate the explosion on top of it. It's very simple, um, except for one thing though, I will, I will note, uh, and again, we'll see if we can, we can show this. So you'll notice it's blue here. Yes. Yeah. It hits and goes purple, which means they had to repaint that drawing. Or at least, you know, do some image manipulation to the drawing. Maybe they just, you know, shined a special light on it and rephotographed it or something. Um, but they had to completely change that color. And, and again, this is just for visual impact. That's all they're doing. Right. And then you get the actual explosion in the background, which just fades in, and then you get the explosion. Um, so on the one hand, not a lot of animation going on, but you feel you know the death of tens of millions of people in that shot. Yeah. Mm. Fun show. Now, to your point here, Steve, that shot that goes from the Earth across gives that sense of scale. Yeah. Start of the Earth, and then we move all the way across here, and then up comes this mecha head uh, deep in space somewhere. And man, look at the go ahead. detail. No, the, just the detail of just the, the movement of, yeah. of the thing. And they're, you can hear the thrusters. And, and as as they're moving in, and you actually have this knowledge of just like they're trying to be stealthy, they're trying to be quiet. Yeah. You know, obviously it's space, but you know they're they're trying to be undetected. And then you again you have this idea of scope of the whole station, and you're like, oh, what what, what are they doing? You know, what, what what's going to happen here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and just having the the breathing. Just yes. Something that you didn't get a lot of in, in, I mean, definitely a callback to 2001, if anything. Um, but it adds that sense of, of dread and stealth. Yeah. Okay, so I have to mention something here. Uh, you see in this shot, it's a little hard to see. Uh, you see the two mecha in the foreground. You see their shadow there on mm -hmm. the, the, the bulkhead. Uh, the way they did that, I think, is they literally had the shadow um, on the cell to begin with and then mm. as you come in on the the colony it is suddenly visible because you're out of space right right um so just by having it there the entire time it becomes visible as soon as something light is behind it which is kind of smart so it's interesting he kneels down to open the thing up we get a sense that these are large robotic things on an even larger surface. Yeah. So how is that? So that kind of tells you that this is a world where there are other types of mechas and things going on that would be natural to have something, a, a knob that would be the size of that of that fist, which would be gargantuan that can, yeah. you, know, you know, just, yeah. Yeah. So you guys are right. That's, that's yeah. a great point. Like, there's no way a human could move that knob. Right. Huh. Interesting. Um, but it's also not sized for a mecha specifically. Like, it's not, you know, true. Do. Yeah. So, which I think goes further to the point that they're not designing for these mecha specifically. They're designing for just right. large machines. Um, yes. Because they're ubiquitous and they, they could be mecha, they could be balls, they could be anything. I also just realized you had two different mecha turning those knobs. One turned one, the other turned the other. Oh, that's right. Implying yeah. some kind of like um, system whereby you need two different mecha. I wonder why that is. I just don't know. And again, 
there's that sense of stealth, right? They knock something over, right. it flies, flies back, and get the sense of, oh, oh, shoot, I stepped on a branch. And again, this great shot of, they've come into a space station, and it opens right. up to steam and rock. What an odd Upper thing atmosphere. to see. Yeah. atmosphere, and then they're just dropping in. Mm -hmm. Like there's still some gravitational, or lack, lack of gravity yeah. in that area. Yeah. Interesting. Here's a point. Mm. I just realized this, even though I've seen this before. Mm. There is no aircraft on the inside of these colonies. You're right. And that's why they're huh. able to drop through, because it's all one big circulars, right? So they would have to be very careful about where they fly. Right. Or else they'll get caught in that lack of gravitation. So yeah. obviously closer to the, the floor, you're going to have the gravity, because that's where the pool is. Mm -hmm. And so you could have actual flight down there but mm -hmm. you can't have it too high yeah so they're able to get in undetected by other aircraft because think about it even though it's it's a huge thing you would notice if three gargantuan <laughs> humanoid things were dropping in mm -hmm. on you from yeah. somewhere right? mm -hmm. so wow yeah that's yeah. a that's a great point um there's also the implication that the uh the docking ports would be more industrial section. It'd be more kind of away from the residential area. Right. So folks aren't paying attention to what's happening on the docks, right? They're just kind of right. doing with their business. Huh. It's also interesting how they're connecting the dots here. Yeah. How you start with the uh, soldiers viewing things. They say, we don't see anyone in the street. Then we see this kid. And now we cut into that kid, uh, you know, Fraubo, entering the house in so much anime of this period it's very much just kind of jumping from thing to thing remember Mazinger right. <laughs> yeah um, we're kind of jumping around to stuff and, and this is it's almost like they are making sure we're really understanding we, we have we're kind of being led along from plot point to plot point yeah so let's point out um, Frau's just walked into Amaro's house um, Amaro has not looked in her direction yet yeah, he's focused. <laughs> a little too focused. A little too focused. And, and notice how she's just like, she's just like, totally blase about the fact that he's in his wife beater and, <laughs> and, and, and you boxers. Know, boxer shorts. And it's just like, okay, they're teenagers. They should be, you know, most anime be like, oh, blush. Mm -hmm. you, know, <laughs> you know, kind of a thing. And, and she's just like, ah. So she knows what this is about already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So she's not. There's already we get the idea that there's not not any we're not going to have that yeah we're not going to have that silliness of 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 teenage drama whatever and it kind of goes back to the guys the the, the, mm. the Zaku pilots looking around when they notice that there's no rush hour they are already on high alert they're mm. even more alert now and something's wrong something's yeah. different true and they're trying to figure that out mm -hmm. she kind of has an idea of something that's going on right now. She probably doesn't have details, but clearly everyone's been evac'd to a point for some mm -hmm. reason. Yeah. And he's just totally focused, whatever. And she's just like, ugh, not again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So again, okay. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, that's a lot of information actually right there. It's true. You know, she's, okay, everyone's gone. Get your butt in gear. Mm -hmm. We got a warship, which denotes that okay, we know that we have to be high on, on high alert because we have a warship, which means that we could be attacked. Yep. Yep. It's very true. Um, also notable that when uh, Frau says we need to leave, Amaro acknowledges that I guess we have to without even realizing there's been an evacuation order. So clearly Frau has been kind of browbeating Amaro to go about his daily life. <laughs> yeah. Like he's just used to Frau coming in and saying it's time to leave now. Um, so, yeah, he's, this is clearly a very um, familiar relationship. Also, just realized apparently in the future, 15 year olds get driver license? driver's licenses. Know, right? Yeah. Huh. Didn't realize that. Yeah. I've, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, Interesting. Yeah, I don't. I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> uh, um, but what was interesting was <clears throat> also ahead mm. of that was a show of. I hate this. Yeah. From the kid, yeah. it's just like going, 
my life has been turned upside down. I kind of like where I used to live, mm-hmm. and you know, this kind of sucks. I kind of sort of blame this guy. Yeah. So he's on his own. I don't care. To that point, we're less than six minutes into this episode, and we're already yeah. seeing mm-hmm. political commentary. Right. Like that's mm-hmm. that that's a statement there that there's there's yeah. gonna be a lot more to come. To your point of polit- politics, this colony was not involved in the war. True. Suddenly, there's a research. His father is involved with mm. it. Well, obviously, he's a federation because he's gone Earthside. Mm-hmm. True. Good point. So he's he's making the thing. Now we all know what he's making. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's the Gundam. Yep. But the research facility is on this neutral ground, and it's kind of like an open secret where it's just like. Okay, this is a neutral supposed to be a neutral colony, and now they all have to, to walk around on tiptoes because now they have this thing here, and you know nobody kind of knows what it is just yet. Mm-hmm. But it's like okay, now we're targets. Thank yeah. you, thank mm-hmm. you, Amaro. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, it also speaks to the fact that like there are no secrets. Um, right. You know, everyone really knows that Amaro's father is working on this this secret mecha project. Okay, got to appreciate the technological um, suggestion there where you see him fly in, you know, holding on to the grip, and then he comes in and kind of glides off of it because presumably we are now in zero gravity, which plays back what we were seeing before, that the center of the colony must be zero gravity. Clearly sort of a hero shot here of Mm -hmm. white base showing up for the first time and a somewhat intimidating shot, uh, you know, from below looking up at it um, kind of in in mostly shadow, very dramatic shot of it, which is interesting given that you know in the rest of the show, White Base has this very um, compact, yes, uh, 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 compact sense, <coughs> and the sense that it is this thing out in the middle of nowhere doing its best, right? White Base is it, right. you know it, is usually kind of this um, almost random element in the war. <laughs> but here we see it as this, the new hope, really, of the war. What do you notice about this shot as it is going into the colony? Its thrusters are not on. Right. Because if its thrusters were on, it would smash into the side of that colony. <laughs> so what they're telling us is, like, they know space. They understand, you know, it's coming in, it just turns its engines off because it's now coasting in to land. Interesting. Now, I had forgotten this. Right. Tem Ray is presented in most of Gundam as this absent, completely forgetful father who is just kind of throwing things on there, you know, and just not really paying attention to his son. He has a photo of Amaro on his desk. Yeah. Like, there's a lot more connection to him uh, with Amaro than I'd realized. And it seems like he has a very much of a goal in mind not just to a the federation must win the war his goal is just like i kind of don't want my kid in the war so Mm -hmm. let's make this doable so that soldiers can actually do it making a point that you know bright is 19 years old which kind of leaves the idea and his comment is just like so we're bringing in everybody Mm -hmm. right now yeah because there's not much left so we're bringing in everybody this Mm -hmm. is this is to the end Yep, yep. Um, you're absolutely right. Like it, it pushes forward that idea that we've lost half our population. There aren't a lot of, you know, fighting soldiers anymore. So it's the the age is getting lower. Hmm. Yeah. Ugh. All right. So I do want to talk for a second about the layout of the ships in Gundam. Um, and I'm not a military, you know, history expert. Um, why on earth? Do you have two like control officers raised up above everyone else on this giant platform with all of these controls all around them? Yeah, it doesn't seem like something you would do. Yeah, uh, you, you know, most bridges, it's everything is right there, mm-hmm. and if anyone's going, and, and what is raised is the, the captain's chair. And, you know, so that he can see everything in front of him and to the sides. And so he's somewhat elevated. This, I don't understand what the purpose of, of that I, is. I, I wonder, is that 
because because I, I at first you would think okay it's to create space for other things but you don't see those other things yeah i wonder if the implication is because you have displays on <clears throat> every surface putting them more in the center of the room if you will and especially high yeah. up allows them to see all of those things everywhere um i don't think that is a a premise that they um showed much in Gundam you know, from that point yeah. forward. Or you can like, see these displays everywhere in the bridges, usually. Um, so I don't know if that was just kind of an idea that they eventually abandoned. Um, and that's the, the premise. But it is a, a very interesting design, because everyone else is on stations you know, all around the bridge like you'd normally expect. Right. Interesting. Interesting moment here of pause, where we have, to your point, kind of all of that info dump around what's been going on, the political situation, um, Tem Ray wanting to stop the war, basically realizing that they're, they haven't shaken that Xeon ship, so bad things are about to happen. And right. I think giving folks that, that the moment of watching White Base come in, pulling back on the colony, gives us that moment to breathe and kind of process that information. And of course, it also allows us to kind of zoom out from White Base and then zoom in on that very Xeon ship we were just yeah. talking about. Yeah. So here, we jump to the bad guys, quote unquote, and unlike so many other shows, we don't jump to them saying, ha 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 ha, ha it is time to destroy the earth, exactly, or saying, um, uh, I have my powerful mecha, I'm going to launch it here. They proceed to repeat all the information that we know, not just to you know, let the audience, you know, remind the audience of the stuff. But I'll also let you know, they are just as well informed as the heroes are. Right. And and to the point, you don't have the sense of, you know, of course, not the, not the dramatic ha ha ha, <laughs> we're going to destroy the earth. But, you know, you have this sense of just like, you know, he's saying we were just on a routine pro patrol and we found this thing. Yeah. Now, that's usually what the good guys say, mm -hmm. hey, we found a thing and we discovered this thing that could be potentially bad to us good guys. Yeah. Here's the bad guys saying, bad guys, <laughs> saying, hey, we found this thing that could be bad for us. Yeah. And you realize that that's not an awful observation if you're trying to be, if you're concerned about self-preservation. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's not just about like, Here's war and just, you know, the good and the bad. These guys are just like, ah, you know, I don't want to die. <laughs> yeah. You know, basically. <laughs> and we found this thing. So we're going to have to figure this out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely right. And here we cut back to those Xeon pilots. And now we're starting to pull together the plot. You know, we had no idea why they were here to begin with. They just show up. Um, I mean, what's like the first line of the, of the show? Stay here. What does right. that mean? Um, and we know they're scouting everything. Now we've figured out all the stuff that's going on on the colony. We now, we, we zip back up to uh, what's going on with White Base. We moved over to Xeon. We know what Xeon knows. Now we kind of square the circle with these guys who are reporting the information back. And you realize the bad guys not only surmise what's going on, they have intel on the ground on exactly what's happening. Right. And again, nine minutes in. <laughs> <laughs> so here, you know, one of the Xeon soldiers, Gene, says basically, well, I'm going to move forward even though it's not in our orders. It's interesting here because his, well, he then provides this rationale that if we don't move here immediately, they load those parts onto white base and they're good to go. I'm going to show initiative. His fellow soldier says this in subordination, and he goes, well, you know, unless I'm, I succeed, and then I'm a hero. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's so interesting seeing, a, again, a sort of bad guy doing this thing where you think, yeah, actually, that is a I, thing yeah, that you would probably want to do. Yeah. And it should be pointed out, like, this is a point in the war where the Zeon, or, I'm sorry, the Zaku is the ultimate fighting machine. Right. All they've got are a bunch of spare parts getting loaded on, onto a ship. He's right. Like, <laughs> if yeah. these things weren't active, this would be just, you know, shooting 
Fish in a Barrel. Fish in a Barrel, yeah. Can you see death? Yeah, you do. That yeah. that that was that was someone dying. Talk about scale. Yeah. Now Amaro goes outside, and we get this sense of what's going on. Now, before we've seen actual soldiers doing this, uh, now we see what it's like for a civilian to suddenly be confronted by a, a Zaku that's actively firing. Right. Wow. And, and personally, myself, if I were to walk out of the door and see that firing, I'd be really like... Yeah. <laughs> a brown pants moment. <laughs> yeah. Talk about scale. Jeez. Getting to see those uh, spent shell casings come down. That's really cool. Oh. Speaking of death. <laughs> yeah. Um... Also interesting use of um, this particular style, this um, stylized drawing to draw impact to the moment, where it's just a single drawing that we're kind of pulling back on, uh, but just by having those bright yellows and, and blood reds right. really gets across the, the drama of the moment. So it's interesting what they're doing here visually. You've got the background, which they're pulling back on, uh, but you also have the smoke at the top of the screen and then yeah. the two little trails of smoke coming up from it. It's a relatively simple effect, but it really adds a lot. I think if this was just the background, it would feel a little dry and clinical, if you will. Um, having the movement of the smoke uh, adds atmosphere, but then also adds the idea that this is this just happened. We must acknowledge it. Here we have one of the most convenient moments in all of Gundam, <laughs> where the operating manual just so happens to land at almost literally the feet of Amaro. <laughs> but you know, sometimes you gotta you gotta have it happen. Okay, I do have to point out. Yeah. He just said oh, it's classified and opens it. It opens it. Um, which, in fairness, like if fifteen-year-old kids, yes, that is a thing they do. Although, if it were me, I probably wouldn't have even noticed it because I would have been like, <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> but again, to that point, like this moment would not work if we had not seen Amaro focused on the engineering on earlier. It. Right? As soon as he sees technical documents, he's going to be immediately sucked in. Also, I just love the kind of blocking of this shot. Um, how you have uh, Shark kind of in the background providing the information. Um, it just communicates a lot while also giving you a sense of the ship as a whole. So, I'm just realizing this. That rocket has a line on it. Yeah, it's a tow. Yeah, I, I, I thought that yeah. was just like a trailing smoke line, but there's other smoke <laughs> behind it. They are trying, because they're not trying to explode the Zaku, they're trying to take them down. Right. Like, hit it into them and then pull them over because that's something you would do with a large, potentially top-heavy machine. Fascinating. I had I had not realized that at all. That's cool. So I think that's cats. What's that? I think that's cats. I think that's one of the kids who oh. ends up on white base. Oh no! Look, 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 look in the background. Oh yeah. That's one of the other kids running in the background. Wow. So they're layering in all the other characters. <laughs> so I gotta tell you, this is like a moment of. Well, I was going to go to town and get my power converters. <laughs> um, Absolutely. You know, you know, he's just, he's being really whiny. He's being a kid. Mm -hmm. And he's not understanding that his father is just like, not now. <laughs> yeah. Up there. Death around us. Go. Yeah, right. You know. Um, it's also kind of interesting how his father's, um, response is also kind of like he's clearly used to this right you know his son comes running up to him in the middle of a battle when everyone should be evacuating he's like what are you like, go go back just go back you know <laughs> going home rover go home go home right <laughs> um you know it's like this kind of thing has happened before i also do wonder how much this is playing off of the trope that the hero always gets to get into the, you know, the mecha at, 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 in the very beginning. And it's always kind of like, they're always protected 
in the in that sense right. where yeah. there's always a chance for them to go in. Like there may be danger going on, but they can always just kind of hop in. There's constant explosions while he's just sitting there talking. Um, so they're kind of playing around with the fact that like this, this kid's an idiot for not like getting to safety. Right. Now, it has to be pointed out here um, in one of the most tragic moments in in this episode. Uh, what saves Frau's life? The fact that she cares about Amaro. Right. And that really becomes, that is, I think, one of the bigger themes of the show is the fact that, like, her caring about other people is her center. Um, and that really is what defines her in a lot of ways. So, yeah, this is a pretty rough moment. Yeah. Um, we've seen people die, soldiers, random people, etc. This is the first time when civilians we're aware of have been <coughs> hit, and right. there's that slowly dawning realization of this isn't just random people. These are like Frau's parents. Yeah. And it's, and it's also that the we have taken the convention of we don't see this off screen or you know we we see this off screen you know mm-hmm. like like you know, yeah we, we get we get the message that they're dead mm-hmm. we don't see it but it also takes away the rule of it's only the good guys versus the bad guys mm-hmm. now we're seeing like this is a war and there are people dying and uh, because they're getting caught in the crossfire of this war mm-hmm. which is what is what makes war so horrible yep. and so this is this is what we're getting here we're, we're getting the idea of, you know we're starting to get slapped with that two by four you know <laughs> this is works bad yeah you know? exactly <laughs> you know, absolutely and it's it's interesting that it's happening so early and so directly to us yeah and they really let this ride uh you know you yeah. have the tragic woman tragic music in the background but we're really sitting in this moment because again these are 15 year olds watching people die right and left like they are they are understandably traumatized in the moment <laughs> okay I, I just i just thought karma you know. <laughs> karma's gonna get him in the end on that one yeah so the, the first slap of the show i think we, we need a tally up here somewhere yeah um but i this is worth talking about because one of the things you could argue is that Amaro is somewhere on the spectrum, right? Right. Um, and you, you see indications of that here with his intense focus on his hobbies and, and such. But it's also notable here in this moment because he sees all this death and he clearly is affected by that. But as soon as Frau goes over, he comes over and goes, Frau, you got to get out of here. Like, why haven't you snapped out of this yet and run? Like, I don't understand right. why you haven't, like gotten over this emotional issue and go now, like, like shift and go. So this does kind of add a little more fuel to the fire of that argument. There's also the interesting contrast between like, he yells at her, run quickly, and she's clearly hearing him and doing what he says, but she can't. Right, yeah. I mean, she, well, I mean, her mom just blew up. <laughs> I, know, yeah. I mean, you know. Come on. Jeez, Brent, come on. You know, so what? Her mom just blew up. Grandpa, too. Yeah. And, and, and if old Yeller was there, too, so what? You know? <laughs> come on, Frog. Get your butt on the, on the spaceport. Here I go. Okay. So, great moment here. You see him with his uh, eyes full of tears, and then he does this um, move where he suddenly stands up. The tears clear out of his eyes from his motion as he makes a decision to actually do the thing. Right. Do the thing. Yes. Yeah. He's going to go grab the Gundam and fight. And it is this moment of determination and decision. And his, it is his action that kind of dries the tears, if you will. Right. It's kind of like that moment where he just kind of just said, Oh, okay. She's really upset. And I'm not really processing this very well. Of course, I've been blown across half the campus here about three times. Um, But he's just like, this is almost like someone getting PO'd about somebody else having problems. Yeah. Like, this is like a a moment of empathy for him that we're not going to get a lot of. True. You know, and and when we do get it, it usually is centered around Frau or somebody he really cares about. Yeah. And so, you know, to the point, you know, where he's just like, okay, I don't like this. This sucks. And, well, 
I got a thing over here. Mm -hmm. Let's let's do the thing. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's also a testament to how thoroughly Gundam thinks through the personalities of its characters that in so many of these mecha series it's Big robot. Want to get in big robot and fight people? Sure, I'll jump in big robot and fight people. I hope that works out well. You know, they had to establish all of these different things to push Amro to the point where he's willing to get into the Gundam. You know, right. The average 15-year-old person is not, is not going to go out and essentially jump in a fighter plane and go out and hope that everything works out. Well, you know, and, and to the point of what we've seen of Amro to this point, it, which is him being so hyper-focused on, on things that he's you know, externally shutting other things out. Mm -hmm. He's doing that, but on purpose now, right? He's, You're right. He's basically, he's just saying, okay, I know how to shut these things out and down mm -hmm. so that I can do these things over here. And that's what he's doing. You're absolutely right. Here's the girl. Oh, yeah. Uh, right, yeah. right there. About to see yeah. her in a moment. So, Amaro got in the suit, um, and... Now we have the Zaku pilots sort of arguing. And it's interesting here to, to note how Gundam uses the mecha as stand-ins for the pilots themselves. There is yeah. absolutely no reason for these mecha to actually be in these you know, physical positions. But it gets across the shock of the one and the um, concern and sort of hesitancy of the other one. It perfectly yeah. represents like what the pilot, how the pilots would be standing in that situation. Again, getting back to the idea of scale, um, but this is just a, oh, yeah. a great shot. You have this vehicle moving uh, sort of ballistically out of the shot, if you will, although it's literally you know, there, but you, the sense that it's moving forward. You have the Gundam moving right to left in the background um, just very dynamic, very visually interesting shot. Something you really did not see a lot of in anime up to this point. Uh, just th this this sense of lots of things happening at once. I don't care. How that's why I like about this. Mm. It's not unlimited ammo. Yeah. <laughs> you only have so much. Mm -hmm. and, and, but it does, and it speaks to his experience of just like. Because he's just walking, just like, I'm just going to blaze everything <laughs> in my past. It's also interesting because, you know, only a couple of episodes later, we see him even run out of beam energy. Um, right. You know, everything on that, that mobile suit is limited. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's great. So I'm still unclear. I, I, I'm assuming what's happening here, which, again, you don't get without a lot of more context. So he's surprised because, and we'll go back here a little bit, um... He's surprised because the Gundam actually like grabs him and engages him in grappling effectively. Right. And the reason is Zeon's the only side with mobile suits. Right. They've never had to fight mobile suits before. So they're just thinking in terms of blowing up things. They don't think through the consequences of if I get within point blank range of this mecha, it can actually like physically grab me and throw it back. And that's why he's so shocked. And again, to, to that, that point earlier, um, right. this is not the pose a mecha would actually be in, but that is how he is emotionally reacting in the moment, of just this, oh, oh my gosh. So it's interesting to notice a couple of things here. Uh, Amaro <laughs> is so focused on Jean, he jumps over right. another mobile suit that is like <clears throat> right there for the taking. Right. <laughs> but it's like, no, he has to, again, that, that hyper focus on that one thing. I won't let you get away, so I'm going to take care of you instead of like, you just, just hit him on the way back. No. Um, and then, of course, this, this amazing shot of the beam saber hitting him in the back. Um, uh, and this idea, and obviously, a very samurai kind of sense of hitting, hitting somebody there. But then the follow through. <laughs> I mean, that's, yeah, he's, he's not recovering from that. Um, and the fact that we know from what we saw in before where the pilot is seated. Yes. What are the consequences? <laughs> right. <laughs> like, you look cool, and you also, well, like, yeah. You're back to the enemy. Mm -hmm. Speaking of consequences. <laughs> yeah. 
And so, and, and we get the reverse of that shot from before of the beam hitting the colony from the outside, hearkening back to that moment and realizing the fragility of this, this space. Everything's coming back around. And, um, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, that's the thing. Remember your dad was in the, the vehicle yeah. and there's, there's now a big hole right where he was? Yeah, bad news. Ooh. And it should be pointed out here, Amaro's next decision, which he executes here, is to execute the pilot. Yeah. It's not to sweep his legs out from under him. <clears throat> it's not to disable. It's, I got to just kill the guy. Wow. And then we cut back to the Musai and Shar to remind us that all we've done so far is take out a couple of mobile suits and done nothing with, like, the main force of the enemy that's outside the station. Right. <laughs> like, out of the frying pan into the fire. There we go. Yeah, that's episode so, one. Kids, here's an easy easement into Gundam. <laughs> you know, just, just a nice, placid, yeah. you know, just walk in and you know, here you go. Here's the giant robot. Nothing mm -hmm. bad's gonna happen. Yeah, it's fine. No, within, no it's fine. Within ten minutes, everything's like, oh god, oh god, <laughs> fire, death, and you know, you know explosions like silhouettes of people's like, ah. and and just just mayhem and and oh, hey, Frau, sorry, your mom's dead. Um, mm -hmm. Can you please get up on the? On the... <laughs> Come on. Yeah, it is amazing and, how much they pack into this. And it, and do you? realize that the only really calm person out of all this or the two calm people out of all of this mm. is the is the current captain of white base true and char yeah you're right because they're the ones with the experience they're, yeah. they're just like because we get that at the end of you know the episode of char saying well well that did not go well <laughs> at all and this kind of sucked but okay well this is what we gotta roll with mm -hmm. and the captain of the white base going here's what we got to do and get the thing and, and go and you know just you know issued the orders yeah um, and 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 bright we're starting to see a little bit more about bright mm -hmm. you know being able to to be the soldier yeah mm -hmm. um i mean even he in this episode he's very tentative when he first meets tim ray you know he's right he's very much the i just joined up i don't really know uh what the pecking order is exactly um, I'm still figuring it all out. Um, and you, you get that sense that he has his head screwed on straight, um, but he's definitely a minor character in all this at this point. Um, right. And, and to your point, like, he's not confident. He's not, like, he hasn't figured, he hasn't figured it all out. He's just there, if you will. Um, you're absolutely right. Like, everyone else is just scrambling around trying to figure out what to do. Um... But yeah, it, it's amazing how much is going on in this episode and how much, even for the animation of the time, it does have power in his visuals. Uh, it yeah. Is, it is really trying to get across a lot, but also be visually stimulating. Well, it, and that, and I think that, again, um, you know, we get the realism of war here in, in so far that this was just when you look at it, it feels like you went through all the theaters of World War II mm -hmm. in this episode, right? But to your point, no, really, it was just three Zaku's dropped in, kid got lucky in the Gundam, <laughs> right? Yeah. And one managed actually to get out. And so much damage was done just mm -hmm. on that. Yeah. So what would happen if you actually had a large scale battle happen? Right. This was not a large scale battle. This was a skirmish. That's, mm -hmm. that's all it was. Yeah. And all these people died and all these mm -hmm. things happened. Yeah. And it, you know, you just kind of, at the end of it, you're just like, I am so drained. <laughs> uh, and then you're just like, okay, we're going to binge the next 10 episodes. <laughs> I don't think I can. Because that's what Gundam does so well at its best. Yeah, is it highlights the uh, emotional drain of war. Um, it really makes you feel that trauma 
of what it's of what is like to lose people of of the the right. sense of of the senselessness and all the death uh you it, it is draining in that way uh and it does it in a, a very impactful way and it doesn't stop no. i mean what's the last scene two ballistic torpedoes yeah. i guess come, coming from the musai with charge is going oh, well that's not go ahead and blow it yeah mm -hmm. you know you're absolutely right uh, it, it is this this moment of dread of oh my gosh they're gonna they're gonna kill a lot of more people now yeah <laughs> yeah it's it, it is amazing uh, and how much they get across and again this is the first episode and we already know Zion Federation um, war for independence not going well for the Federation secret uh, project. All this world building stuff has also been established, as well as introducing us to basically every character we're going to see for the next like 10 episodes. Yeah. Uh, and it's just crazy how much pact is, 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 is in there. And, and here's the thing, uh, folks buy the toy. I mean, literally, I mean, can, <laughs> you, you know, you, you're supposed to buy the toy, but can yeah. you just be the toy manufacturers and just like you're going into the. To the little viewing room, and you're just going. We're gonna see that. We're gonna see the cartoon, the anime that's gonna sell our sell our stuff, our our little war toys that the boys get. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, this is not War Story Gundam, right? right? It's just Mobile Suit Gundam. It's just, you know, almost literally, it's toy toy. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mecha thing is basically the title of the show you'd have no idea without going in and going oh my well a lot of people sure died there <laughs> i get to see like like if they actually made this made the toys real to the to the, to the anime they would actually have like a a a replica colony mm -hmm. and little buttons that you can push where spring loaded civilians go. Whoops, <laughs> noise, so go ah. That's horrible. Yeah. Uh, five dead bodies with each mobile suit. It's, it's great. Um. <laughs> Your kid can live, can live the traumas of war. <laughs> uh.